Welcome back, Postables, to another exciting episode. And we have a surprise for you. Are you ready for this, everybody? <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, Postables, you're listening to Deliver Me a Podcast, brought to you by Casey, Jess, and Cami. A special thanks to James Jandrish for letting us use the music on our show. Now, sit back, relax, grab a YooHoo and a stamp collection, and here we go. Well, Martha, thank you so much for agreeing to chat with us this morning. We are so thrilled and so delighted that you're here. I'm thrilled. This has been a, such a long time coming, and I really wanted to um, just find the right time to do this, and it felt mm-hmm. like you know, the week before the show airs, just and and mm-hmm. I put the finishing touches on it yesterday with James Jandrish, <gasps> and yeah. so um, you know I thought this is just exactly the right time to do it when I can, you know I can relax and really feel mm-hmm. good that 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 um, that I know what what you're about to see too. So <laughs> right. We're so eagerly anticipating this. It's been a long three no years. Yes. We have no words for how much we are anticipating. <laughs> Me too. I, I think so. It's been um it's it's been a long run and it's been um I just can't believe it's been that long since it, since it aired. Of course, it hasn't felt like that long to me because I was in the process of working on it and writing it and prepping it and shooting it and editing and all of that. Right, so, all this time. Right, but um, uh, it was the the pandemic uh, really made it important to be able to uh, just stop and step back and gave me some extra time to really think it through. And I think that was really you know, um, a, a, a very, in a strange way, a very helpful situation because sometimes things happen so quickly. You don't have mm-hmm. time to, um, uh, uh, you know, to really step back and get a more perspective on the story you're telling. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity to really sit down and go through social media, which I really don't. Um, I try not to because it, it can, um, it can either lift you up so much that you lose you lose your ability to be self-critical about your work, or it can, you know, discourage you, and and then you're too critical about your work. So I usually don't watch those things, but I did try to to see what people were saying that they wanted, and mm-hmm. uh, what they what what questions had yet to be answered. What what um, confusion still reigned, um, and uh, and. So I, I really sat down and, and got into some of the deeper things with with our characters. And uh, I think I think you'll see that this time. Absolutely. We know it'll be worth the wait, so. <laughs> I hope so. I know you'll let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's dive right into our first question. So clearly you're a very gifted storyteller. And so, We were curious if writing was something that you were interested in from very young age or did it develop more as you got older? I always was a writer. I was always writing. Um, When I was a very, very young, when I was three, I mean, not three, in third grade, I Mm -hmm. remember writing my first short story and fell in love with the idea. And it was was about somebody kidnapping Santa Claus and... (laughs) how he sent them a secret coded message to turn the world upside down so that the man thought he was at the South Pole instead of the North Pole and would release him. And I don't know what I, I don't know what I was talking about, but I loved it and I got an A. And so I said, I, I can do this. So I just kept writing. That's very involved for a third grade. Yeah. Well, then there was another disturbing one about, you know, a plane crashing on a desert island. It was sort of a precursor to Lost. Oh, there you go. I didn't go there either. My, that was when the teacher wrote home to my mother and said, we need to have a conversation about your daughter. So <laughs> I went from Christmas to very dark for a while there, but but it all balanced out. So. Oh, good. <laughs> Did you do a lot of writing in high school and in college and just developing that skill? I did. Um, most of the writing in high school was were just really 
a lot of bad poetry about boys who wouldn't give me the time of day. <laughs> okay. And, um, but when I got into college, uh, I started writing uh, for the, there was an organization called um, uh, Cap and Bells, and we could write our own our own plays and our own shows. And I started writing uh, with a partner, uh, Mark Lichtman, who uh, is a composer. He ended up being the composer for all the music on uh, Touched by an Angel. And he oh. actually composed the music for Deliver Me. And oh. send oh. me love every day and send me on my way, deliver me, well, you know, the song. Yeah. Uh, but it was Mark who wrote that that brief little uh, opening. And so Mark and I wrote music, um, some musicals uh, at my college. And I fell in love with that, fell in love with um, just, just putting words uh, on paper and then hearing them and standing in the back of a room and hearing people laugh or cry is magical. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just an amazing feeling and a tremendous sense of power actually. And um, and so Mark and I work together all those years, and every once in a while we come together and write another song or so just for fun. Um, but um, we had a, a really good time writing, and I realized then that that's what I really wanted to do. For a while, I thought I'd be a singer, but I, I'm I was good enough to sing with my group, but not good enough to pull it off by myself. So. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, you're speaking up Cammy's alley right here, musical yeah. and all of that. <laughs> really like going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. All I did was um, on Sunday, mo Saturday mornings, my mother made me uh, uh, dust and clean and, and wash the Venetian blinds. And so I would put on Broadway show LPs and sing along while I while I did all the housework upstairs. Oh, Love that. And after my own heart, <laughs> my background is in theater. So. Ah, right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very big on theater. <laughs> what, have you, what have you done? Oh, goodness. Um, my favorites that I was in, I, I was to Moon and Once on this Island. And I was uh, Dolly and Hello Dolly. Of course, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I've also done Peter Pan, mm -hmm. uh, Bye Bye Birdie, uh, Fiddler on the Roof twice. I love Fiddler. I love Fiddler. Yeah. Oh, uh, my my favorite one that I have yet to be in, but I love is Wicked. I love Wicked. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It's <laughs> a good one. Doing it. Yeah, we, have, we just have to keep finding ways to do those things that we love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. My, my children are a sometimes willing audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. My children are saying, oh, mother, not Rogers and Hammerstein again, please. <laughs> well, how did you get your start in the film industry? Ah, well, that comes from um, uh, from my college. I was uh, I I was walking through campus and I wanted a milkshake. And I walked into the snack bar and I ran into a friend of mine named Peter Bergathon, who's a very very highly respected um, neurologist now, and I think something of an epidemiologist as well. But at any rate, he was studying for his uh, medical at the MCATs. He wanted to get into med school. And Peter saw me across the snack bar and said, Martha, you've got to help me out. Please be the escort. Uh, and that was in the best possible sense of escort um, host um, at um, for me, because I signed up to help be one of the hosts for this uh, uh, big a seminar on the arts and management and entertainment careers and will you go and do it for me and I said oh, okay so I walked in and there was an alum who was uh, writing uh, from uh, Hollywood and he was writing a, 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 a sitcom and I I was assigned to him and I said you are the only person I know in Hollywood and I am now going to um haunt you constantly until you help me figure out what to do. And um, I, I graduated, I would write him again, bad poetry, but I'd write funny things, you know, funny little notes, you know, about how I needed a job and how I wanted to, you know, how I wanted to get a break. And it took about two and a half or three years. And one day I get this note and he says, 
Um, the guy who uh, produced Carol Burnett and the Carol Burnett show is uh, doing a Broadway show and he needs an assistant. And I told him about you and you should go and uh, apply for the job. So I did, and uh, it was it was funny because he was he was uh, in New York at the time, and he, he, I was supposed to meet him in his hotel room, which I don't recommend anybody do now. <laughs> but I walked into his, I knocked on the door, and he said, "Come in," and he was on the phone, and he kind of waved me in and said, "Sit down." And I'm sitting there just waiting, and he, it was very clear to me that he had to be at the airport in less than two hours to catch a plane back to Los Angeles, and I looked around, and he hadn't packed, oh. so I just got up and started packing, <laughs> and he's, he's on the phone, he says, you're not going to believe this, but my new assistant has just started packing for me, and, oh. and, and that was that. I got the job, because Dang. I didn't even, I, I, he didn't even inter interview me. He just saw that I saw what needed to be done. Yeah, yeah. Take the initiative. Yeah. yeah. So then from then on, it was, that was me. I started working for him. His name was Kenny Soames. And mm -hmm. uh, that it, and he was part of that whole Carol Burdett group. And I, that's how I got to meet Carol and, and the, uh, so many wonderful people um, in, who had worked with Carol and for Carol. And um, before I knew it, I was just, I was the kid, the kid in variety. <laughs> I, got to, I got to meet amazing people pretty pretty incredible people so well and one thing that's become very obvious is you never forget your friends because mm -hmm. they're sprinkled all over, over the place <laughs> yeah I don't I I, I think um, if you could see the other side of this room I have a sign um, that says that that quotes um, uh, the poem that says my glory was I had such friends and I, I said, maybe, maybe that should be on my tombstone, but that is the best thing about me is that I have wonderful friends and that I, I, I'd be a fool to forget them. <laughs> and uh, they've been, and I just have made, you know, made so many along the way, but I also made a lot of good friends before I ever had one ounce of success in, in this business. And, uh, and I still, and they are still part of my life. Mm -hmm. They are still part of my life. As a matter of fact, um, one of them has um, you every once in a while you hear Dr. Nichols, you know, whenever there's a hospital scene mm -hmm. and yeah. you'll hear Dr. Nichols, please report to emergency or surgery or whatever. And that's one of my best friends from college, Dr. Gwen Nichols. And um, she has been the consultant on all of our um, anything medical. I would call up Gwen and say, Ooh. what's you know how how could this be or you know when um when joe fell you know and lost without you yeah. and joe falls you know and i said could this really happen could he really go septic could he you know she's, oh, here's what here, i said here's what i need to happen you know <laughs> and so she she's always been a, a wonderful um a wonderful support well let's talk about some of those friends on touched by an angel for a minute because oh, yeah. We all, because we all love Touched by an Angel and, oh, thank you. you know, there are so many things that we've seen kind of blend over from Touched right. by an Angel, especially going back and watching mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. episodes. But one of the biggest things is how you use faith and spirituality. They play such big roles in Touched by an Angel, obviously, and even in Sign Sealed Delivered. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about your method, about how you incorporate faith into your productions without going overboard. And as you've said before, being too preachy, because that's, that's one thing that I noticed immediately when I found Sign Seal Delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, this is remarkable. I didn't know who wrote it. I didn't, I, I recognized Eric because I had seen him on how to fall in love. And so I just started watching and I was like, this is remarkable. How does she do, whoever is writing this, how do they do it? With, how, how do they do such amazing <laughs> themes of faith and spirituality without being too pushy about it? Because the, I've seen so many and they are just shout in your face about being, about uh, coming to Jesus or repentance and all of that. And I'm just like, this is remarkable. How are they doing this? So. A lot of altar calls. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, starting with, with Touched, um, 
I remember I had started working for CBS mm -hmm. uh, a long, long time ago because it was essentially the home uh, network for Carol. So I found a lot of connections there at CBS. Wow. And then they started hiring me to quote, you know, fix things or step in. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, there was a show called Under One Roof. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this was a family, probably a family of faith, because there was a scene in it where they said, said, their, said the blessing, a grace before dinner. Mm -hmm. But the problem was it was like, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. And I felt like um, the script that I had been given to work with did not know how to show a family of faith. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said, that is what I, I know how to talk about, but I was already beginning with a family. Yeah. And so you start with the people, you start with the, you start with their relationships and you don't, you don't make, you don't make religion um, it all about religion. You just incorporate it as part of who they are. And so I remember changing that to something, that prayer that the little boy, I had the little boy say it. And he said, um, he was really, really hungry. And I said, why don't you just say, thank you, Father, for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. And because he's hungry. Yeah. He's hungry. He wants to eat. <laughs> what's true. It, what mattered was that the, the, the family had had... A, a, a way of, of sharing what I share, which mm -hmm. was our faith. Yeah. And so the, I remember the network said, what did he say? I said, in Jesus name, amen. And they said, well, why, but, but why would they say that? I said, because that's what you say sometimes if in, from certain churches. And, it, and so um, they said, all right, because they were not, weren't used to saying Jesus. They said, well, is this a show about Jesus? I said, no, this is a show about a family that prays before dinner. And that's mm -hmm. what they say. That's what's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that to me was the, 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 um, the light bulb went on that, that what you have to do is go to what's, what shared deeply with people's hearts mm -hmm. and, and work from the inside out. If you try to lay religion on top of something, then it's like you said, it's going to feel preachy. So it, it so then they they because of the in Jesus name, amen moment, when touched by an angel became an opportunity and they weren't quite sure what to do with that. Um, they called me because they said, well, call Martha. She's she goes to church or something. <laughs> So or I something said, or something. <laughs> and and so that that's when I came in to to look at the pilot that they had there, which I subsequently refused to work on because it was, in fact, that very thing that I didn't mm -hmm. like. And mm -hmm. um, and then they said, well, what have you started over? So I said, I will. But I have to. Um, they said, but you're going to have to, like, create a whole new Bible for the show. And I said, no, they're there is a Bible for the show. It's called the Bible. <laughs> and let's just go to what the Bible says about angels and, and stick with that, you know, that they bring messages, that they bring healing, that they bring, um, you know, sometimes they fight for you that, you know, let's just look at what that is. And, um, and as a result, we, uh, we dispensed with the, the funny, stuff that they tried to do where they had Della Reese smoking and, you know, drinking and they were swearing and all of that. We just, I said, we got to get rid of all of that and go back to what they know, which is mm -hmm. angels don't need faith because they know what's true. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they ju and so, um, so it became a, a story about people who just had already incorporated what they believed, what they knew to be true. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything that you had to push on people. They just, share what they knew. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so when we finally got to sign seal delivered, um, I thought, how do we, how do we do this with humans? <laughs> oh, yes. A little different story. Humans always have a different story, right? <laughs> um, and, um, so we, um, we sat down and talked about it with, uh, the executives there. And I said, I, I think that 
we, I want to show that there is a divine purpose in all of our lives. Mm -hmm. And the letters themselves are um, metaphors <laughs> for, the, for the divine purpose. And we don't have to say, God has a purpose for your life, and here it is on a letter. Right. What you need to see is somebody like an Oliver who is is trying to find a purpose for himself mm -hmm. and find a, find a purpose for his work. I mean, here's a guy who oh, subsequently became really, really rich, right? Mm -hmm. And he could have quit, but that's not his purpose. Quit the post office? <laughs> <laughs> that line. Like, yeah. so, how dare you? <laughs> So that's because, so that's, this was a, you know, something deeper had to be accomplished by, by, by deliverance. So every, every word in a weird way, if you go back and you look and see some of those words that we have in this show, they will recur. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the, uh, the sense of delivery, deliver me to be delivered. Um, you don't have to hit people over the head with it it's going to resonate with the people who know what I'm saying. You know, mm -hmm. like I was thinking the other day, one of my favorite moments, because I love to write lyrics, is, um, you know, she's Miss Special Delivery. Yes, she's our post office queen. And um, the from Rocky Mountain to Field and Fountain and every zip in between, right? <laughs> the words Field and Fountain, if, if you grew up in my church, you'll recognize that that phrase comes from joyful, joyful, we adore thee. You know, mm -hmm. da, 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 field and fountain, flashy. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So there are words that are going to resonate with people who do go to church or are people of faith. Um, and then, and yet they're still going to work in the real world, mm -hmm. you know, to folks who are just watching the show. And if you can mm -hmm. do that, then um, then you you are not preaching, you're just sharing. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> yes. And I know like um, the three of us, I mean, we all have different faiths, but we do have, you know, we are people of faith. And so that has been something that's come up in our conversations. Like, well, like I remember hearing um, joy in the morning and from the heart. And I was like, oh, that's, that's in the Bible. I remember that specifically. So little different things that you've incorporated. Um, I've definitely, I definitely, like we've picked up for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most profound one for me personally is the Christmas episode. Uh -huh. um, when they had, um, I think it's Rita who says, oh, we forgot the most important thing. And it was Jesus. And I was like, the theme of this episode is the fact that you know, during the holidays, we get so busy with everything else going on. You know, we have the pageantry, you know, we have the church stuff, we have decorating at home and the, the dinners with family and stuff. And so sometimes we forget about the most important thing and the reason for this season, which is Christmas. And that just resonated so much with me. We had a huge um, conversation about it. Yeah, it was, really? it was incredible because, um, you know, as my kids are getting older and both my in-laws and my family is here in the same town. And so like things just get really, really busy. So it was a great remi reminder, um, you know, to keep Christ at the center of Christmas, especially when things get really crazy. So I just loved how that, um, that theme just popped up. Like I wasn't thinking of it when I was watching the, sh the, the movie, but Man, when that popped up, I was like, whoa, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I'm so glad you, you, you remember that one. The, um, it's a perfect example for somebody uh, who's, who is asking this question. How do, you, how do you get the message out if you want to? And I think the most powerful ways to get messages like that out are if you, fill, if you put the blank out there and let the audience fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Someone had had a little ornament and said, "Well, we don't want to forget Jesus is the reason for the season." You know, I just, you know, that just makes me crazy. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you say, "Don't forget the most important thing," and then then the audience or the viewer is going to go, "What is the most important thing?" Oh, it's the big. Oh, that's Jesus. Oh, that's Christmas. Now you now they're making the connection, and that comes from something within themselves, mm -hmm. and um, that's. That's powerful, I think, if you can accomplish that. And sometimes you can, sometimes you don't, but it is a tricky line to walk. But mm -hmm. I think, I, and of course you have these incredible actors who, who 
know how to, what I say, throw, throw the line away. Mm -hmm. So she didn't say, don't forget the most important thing. You know, it's <laughs> just, oh, we don't want to forget the most important thing. You know, and that's that's what makes it work is that mm -hmm. it, it's an organic moment mm -hmm. for them. It's you authentic know? for sure. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Yeah. All right, one more question about sign sealed. I mean, <laughs> about touch by an angel. <laughs> <laughs> we moved on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, I know this is going to ask you to pick one of your favorite children, but do you have a favorite Touched by an Angel episode? Wow. Um, I would say I have a couple. One is the um, the episode about slavery in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, that was very powerful for me for a number of reasons. Number one is that um, I had a friend um Sonia Hudson, who had uh, worked on the show, and she kept saying, you really need to look into this. You really need to explore this issue. And I was terrified. It was so um, uh, fraught <laughs> and, and, and mm -hmm. deep and dense. And I thought, I'm, I'm not I, Lord. You know, I'm not, I'm not capable of doing this. And I had to do a lot of research. I met with a lot of people. I, we, uh, I met with um, a number of senators in Washington at the time who were working uh, across the aisle, they were collaborating, Democrats, independents, and Republicans all working together. I remember those days, and it was a, a wonderful thing to have them all support me um, with the information I needed to write, uh, I think, one of my most profoundly challenging and satisfying, ultimately, and gratifying episodes. And we did screen that show in Washington um, uh, for... for uh, a joint group a session of Congress. And then that day they passed the um, uh, Sudan Peace Act. So mm -hmm. how, how much more could you hope for? Um, that said, I will say that our, the, the window opened for me on what the possibilities were for something like Touched by an Angel. Um, the very first season, and we didn't even know if we were going to survive on Touched at that point, um, we were all living on the top floor of the Holiday Inn in Salt Lake City, and mm -hmm. our offices were on the first floor of the Holiday Inn in Salt Lake City, and they were so not sure that we were going to survive um, that my office still had the bedboard glued to the wall. So if you walked in and sat at my desk, there was like a bedboard glued to the wall of, it, it, I mean, all they did was just move the the <laughs> <laughs> typing. So we weren't sure what our future was. Um, I walked out one afternoon and lo and behold, there's Gregory Harrison playing tennis with Tree Williams, if I recall. Oh. And, um, and I had worked with Gregory on a show called The Family Man for, mm -hmm. for a season. Um, and that's how I got to know him. Um, I had actually known his mother when I had lived for a while on uh, Catalina Island where he grew up. Yes. Yeah. So we had kind of bonded when we started working together. And then um, I saw him and I, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he said, I saw your show and I want to be part of it. And I said, uh, what do you, what, what would you do? I mean, I honestly, it, he took me aback. He said, I want to do a show about homelessness. Mm -hmm. And so that show about, he said, people don't realize you know, how subconsciously so many of us just assume that a homeless person did something um, to get there. Mm. And it was somehow a, a strange choice or a failure of, um, of, of character. And uh, he said, and I want to really explore that. And I said, you got it. And I uh, sat down and worked on that episode. I worked with my dear friend, Bob Caleri, who worked with me on um, uh, Facts of Life. You know, another, <laughs> another friend connection. You know, you hold on to him as long as you can. So um, Bob and I uh, worked on that homeless episode, and it was one of the most powerful episodes. Um, it's my favorite. Uh, is it? Mm -hmm. Very, very, very powerful. And then um, Gregory took the money that he earned from that show and um, applied it to um, uh, Habitat for Humanity and mm -hmm. build a house with it. I mean, it's stunning. The, the, the building blocks from just meetings, you know, again, right. walking out, I didn't get a milkshake, but I was, who knows why I was walking by the tennis court. <laughs> there it was. 
But that became something that we started doing on Touched. We started uh, reaching out to the star first and saying, what do you care about? What matters to you? What, mm -hmm. you know, what sort of show could we write about that, that would interest you? And so things like that became a, a formula that we had and, and really um, attracted a lot of, of great people. So then, of course, um, when we did Signs Hill Delivered, I couldn't imagine anybody else for Papa <laughs> Joe. I <didn't>. Yes. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gregory shared some of that story uh, when we had him on the podcast uh, for an interview. So. Oh, did he? Oh, a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. it the same way? <laughs> oh, yeah. A couple of differences, but it's fun getting both perspectives. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that, that episode of Touch by Angels, one of my favorites as well, it was. Like, I try not to judge a series too harshly on its first season, but it was that episode, and I was like, this show is, is going to be great. Like, oh. that was the one that made it for me. And we're like, because it was so powerful, like you said, especially when Monica's washing his feet. Oh, my yeah. God. Um, oh my God. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, you know, Jess, that's a perfect example to ask answer Cammy's question, which is, how do you incorporate those messages? Mm -hmm. um, somebody who doesn't know the Bible is still going to be moved by the fact that she humbled herself to say, I, I am sorry. I made it, you know, please forgive me. And um, yeah, I'll never forget that moment when I realized what had to be done. And it came from, again, one of those moments. I did my research. I went to the Union Rescue Mission in Los Angeles. I took a tour, talked to the director. And just as I was walking out the door, I turned around and I said, what is the number one complaint or problem that a homeless person has? The, the, the one thing that if they could change other than you know not being homeless. And, and he said, their feet, they're on their feet all day. They're walking and walking and walking and they have terrible foot problems. And that was the last thing I heard before I walked out. And that's, that became the, the, the nexus of the show. So, you know, it's, God knows what he's doing. I just have to shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we've lost you, Cammy. She's gone. <laughs> Cammy's gone. <laughs> Getting emotional here. <laughs> I know I do. I get very emotional because um, it is such a, a humbling thing to be used by God to, to, and, and, and I, and somebody will, you know, we all know these people who are going to say, oh, yeah, right. That's what she thinks. But I'm telling you, when you sit down at the laptop where I am now and you just sit there with a completely empty screen and you close your eyes and you say, OK, Lord, tell me what to do. You know, it wasn't you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell me that this all came just from little old me. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. And, and nobody can tell you that you didn't have a supernatural experience. Nobody can ever tell you that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just, I'm just so humbled that that show was, it's, that was 19, 1995, I think we did Something that. Show. Like that. Can you imagine how long ago and to still be able to have the opportunity to, to share, you know, right up right up to the very last words of the show you're going to see next week, you will know there was, you know, something really, you know, um, anointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Well, may we say on behalf of <laughs> all the postables and the Touched by an Angel fans and anyone who has had the privilege of tasting of your work, thank you for listening. <laughs> yes, there's it's one thing to receive the message and it's a whole nother thing to take action with it. And so you have definitely, you have been helped, but you have also been the instrument. To, and to obey is better than sacrifice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's, you know, you, it's, I'm, what else would I be doing? I mean, I, I don't know. I was a bank teller and I, I don't know what I had all kinds of crazy jobs in my life. But this was the one that I really wanted. And, and uh, mm -hmm. the other day was saying, I said, I'm just sitting here counting my blessings. And she said, Well, sometimes you should count your dreams. <laughs> and she said, Think about all the dreams that you had that, you know, came true. And I yeah. thought, Oh my gosh, you know, this is it. I, you know, 
how, how much better does it get? So anyway, can, can, can I take a moment to just start talking about these wonderful actors that talk about blessings, the actors that I get to work with? Please. Yes, actually. It's one of our, it's one of our questions. <laughs> <laughs> tell me about, tell me your specific questions and then I'll get into the, into the weeds. Kristen had mentioned that we needed to ask you what your favorite story is about a big name that you had met in business. Oh, oh golly. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then I don't even know where to begin on that one, but um, yeah, there's, it's so overwhelming. I mean, probably um, Rosa Parks um, mm. just to, to the night before she was on sign seal, touched by an angel um, to, to be on your knees in a hotel room praying with Rosa Parks. Wow. Uh, again, how, how does that happen? You know, my greatest dream was to meet Carol Burnett and that happened so early on. I thought it can't get any better than this. And then all the wonderful people that I met along the way and, and, um, people who, who I actually got to become friends with, you know, mm -hmm. huge, but, um, you know, I, it, it Somebody asked me once to sit down and make a list of all the famous people. And I think because I worked in variety, I get to meet some remarkable people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you just you just go on, you know, Eliza Minnelli, Sammy Davis Jr., Steve Allen, um, and, uh, Dolly Parton. I, mean, I just it just goes on and on and on. And you think, oh, my gosh, you know, how did this happen? And, and mm -hmm. uh, from each person, you just take something and almost every single time it's um, it's something about how to be more professional and better at your work. Yeah. I never got an autograph though. I'm not one of those. <laughs> I don't have, if you came to my house, I have no, I don't have one of those hall of fame things where, you know, you, I'm there with, I don't know, okay. Milton Burrell. <laughs> I, yes. I, just, uh, it's you would not have any clue that I had anything to do with show business if you mm -hmm. came to my house. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just hope I don't forget them when I get old. Right. <laughs> right. So jumping specifically to our lovely SSD actors, yeah. um, what is one trait about each of them that makes them the perfect choice for their character? Ah, uh, and see. then you can gush. <laughs> um well it's it's funny because it, it became it, it's all about the casting process so of uh, the and also the fact that and i'm sure they've all told you each each character is some form of me i guess is fair mm -hmm. to say so um oliver was something of the technophobe and and more more than that just to sort of they all called me on on touch by nature they called me conan the grammarian <laughs> <laughs> i was always really specific about making sure even on scripts nobody else was ever going to read i wanted the comma in the right place and the you know, the grammar <laughs> correct and um and so i i knew we had to have somebody who was very specific about getting things right and and mm -hmm. uh, so there was they they wanted me to interview a number of different people for Oliver <laughs> and my, I don't, did, did Eric ever tell you the story about how I interviewed him for the, for the job? Yes. He went into yes. a little bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the, on the cruise ship where I hid in the closet. Yes. And I think he was on his way to like China. Asia, China. Yes. We were yeah. going to China. I was going to Alaska and I, they were trying to clear out the whole cruise ship because y'all had to go for your, uh, um, your practice run on evacuation or mm -hmm. something. Everybody had to go out and wear their, their little, you know, life suits and be counted and i realized i only had this tiny window to talk to to this guy <laughs> eric maybe and um i just hid in the closet so that when they checked the rooms <laughs> they couldn't see me so i'm literally like this and he and i got into some serious conversation about philosophy and and the Kant's categorical imperative or i can't remember what it was but we were sitting there having this philosophical discussion well, well, you know, they're they're blowing horns. And three <laughs> horns means jump ship, or I don't know what they were saying. But the bottom line was, he and I got into such a, a such a philosophical conversation about the you know the meaning of life. And I went, 
that's it. This is the guy, you know, this is the guy. So then we had, um, Kristen had, had sent in, um, sent in a tape and, uh, to, to read for, for, um, uh, Shane. Mm-hmm. And the, the problem is that she was the first person that I saw. It was like the problem, the best problem to have. Mm-hmm. She nailed it immediately. And she had this incredible confidence as if I'm going to get this job. And she had red hair at the time and my hair, you can't really say, well, my hair is sort of red. I would, and so I kind of saw myself in her almost immediately on this tape and she read it just as I had heard it in my head. And uh, from then on, tragically, everybody else couldn't measure up. And <laughs> um, then we still needed to bring her in in person. And uh, they said, she's coming in in five minutes. And I said, okay, let me just run to the ladies room. So I ran down the hall to the ladies room and here's this blonde walking in to the ladies room. And I went, it's you. And she said, oh. and I said, it's not me, Martha. <laughs> and we just, again, it was just immediate connection. And you need to know that you can connect with the, the actors, no matter whether, whether they're perfect for the role or not, you need to know that they will trust you to say, don't do that or do that more or trust me and let me change your, you know, out, your wardrobe or mm-hmm. cross your legs. Or, you know, they need to know that you're watching out for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just, so we, we went to the bathroom together and, and at, by that time, you know, what what more could we have done? <laughs> no better bonding experience. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and and told the rest of the folks, you know, you know, basically this is a done deal. I'm just, you know. So um then um I'm sure Crystal and jo- uh Jeff have told you all the backs and forths of how that happened with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm a um I'm a great believer in in going against expectations. And um, and when this gorgeous woman walks in and just and I said, wow. And then she she says, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I said, oh, I don't know what she's doing here either. <laughs> and, and then she read that one line, that one line. And I, it's from the pilot. You guys will probably remember it better than I will. But it was when she she said about somebody said, you know, you know, Rita, what it's like when you fall in love and nobody understands. And she's, oh yeah, it's, I know what it's like when you're in love with well, somebody, but not really, but you know, sort of kind of, you know. I can't remember what that line <laughs> was, but she, no one had gotten that. She had the complete vulnerability with that one line. Mm-hmm. And that's when we knew who Rita was. And she, she, she could not be separated from Rita after yeah. that. And then when we brought Jeff in, then it was a done deal because the two of them, they were like old pals already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, you just, you can write a great script. You can have a great team of, of people producing, you know, a great production team. But if you don't have the, that lightning in a bottle with those four actors, you, you know, you don't know, you, you, it, it doesn't matter. And yeah. they right. just came together like, like, like butter. Yes. <laughs> yes they are they just the the pairing the four of them it's they just work. such magic on screen and chemistry and the chemistry just definitely shows oh, for sure. My goodness. it sure does it really really does so. mm-hmm. yes is there a particular movie or storyline from a sign seal that is the most meaningful for you now that we've done so many well I know that everybody says um, impossible dream. Everybody loves impossible dream. And that really meant a lot to me. I was, I was, I, I felt um, strongly, you know, the, there, there was sort of a precursor story right before that one Mm -hmm. um, with the same uh, characters. But I, I really felt, I think it was important to show people that you don't get every, I didn't want to tie it all up in a nice happy bow. Yeah. First right. episode to show that because that's what happens with people. You know, it's like Eric or um, Oliver is married, and and 
he just didn't, you know, he, he we needed that tension for Oliver um, to keep not just this tension between him and uh, uh, Shane going, but also to show that this happens to real people and people of faith. Mm -hmm. So that's something that just didn't get solved easily and immediately. And the same thing here, um, that girl wanted her mom back, but mm -hmm. it didn't look like it was going to happen. And she had to find a way forward. Yeah, and I think yeah. that was the best possible thing about that first episode. But then I kept thinking, what if, you know, what if, what if there's a, there is a solution to that? And uh, what if um, you don't give up? Mm -hmm. So um, that was that was very pow powerful for me, and I've always loved that song, "The Impossible Dream," and mm -hmm. um, and and I just was feeling particularly patriotic that month, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that I saw that in my head, I just saw this woman walking across the desert and hearing that song, and and one of the most powerful I, I choke up even now is to see her looking up and waving and and <laughs> we got cammy again <laughs> waving and i just think that's the best of america mm -hmm. and if i'm going to stop and say one thing that's even remotely political it's that never once in that in that movie do you ask if anybody was a democrat or a republican mm -hmm. all you know is that it was the right thing to do and everybody came together to make it happen and so when that helicopter picks them up and, you know, and they say, you know, we've got her, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I wrote it and I cried. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I love that one. Um, the, uh, the one about truth be told is very powerful because, because of my own experience mm -hmm. as one who discovered that my um, biological father was someone besides the father who, who uh, raised me. Oh. Uh, oh, Cammy! Surprise, operator! Hello. I did not <laughs> know that. Yeah, I did yeah. not know that about you. Oh my it's, goodness! Um, there's and that so that has been a theme through my life of um, discovering things, uh, sensing things, knowing things that that weren't quite right. Something was a little off. Um, I will say that I had the two greatest dads in the world and i was blessed to know both of them mm -hmm. and they were um best friends mm -hmm. so uh they right up to the last hours of uh you know joe williamson um they they were together as as friends and they taught me the meaning of the word forgiveness mm -hmm. so you know they were both men of god and again, that just tells you how, <laughs> how um, grace works in the mm -hmm. lives of people who are willing to humble themselves in the sight of God and then allow themselves to be lifted up. Yeah. So, wow. um, so for me, it's about realizing and recognizing that as much as it always will matter that I was raised by three amazing people who also had their own serious issues, um, it doesn't matter. I did not go off on a great journey to discover who I really am mm -hmm. because I was blessed by the time all the truth was told that, um, I was blessed already to know that I'm a child of God. Mm -hmm. So that's what matters. You know, that's, right. that's what matters. And I, I don't think I wasted two minutes worried about, you know, fighting for anything to be you know revealed and to, you know i it, it it wasn't what was important that we loved each other that we forgave each other that we were honest with each other that we didn't carry these secrets around anymore those are the things that ruin a life and right. um, and I, I just wanted to go forward and i and like anything else in life the mistakes that we make um the the experiences that we have good and bad um, are can all be used for good you know uh, all things work together for good to those who love God and so I really mm -hmm. feel that the gift to me has always been being able to take all those things and and turn them into a story that's going to lift somebody else up you know how, do you know how many people wrote to me and said that's my story that's my story that happened to me and and you don't realize that you think you're the only person in the world that this happened no you know 
Mm -hmm. And I started to say that this happened to, but I'm not a victim. It didn't happen to me. You know, it just happened. Mm -hmm. And here I am. What am I supposed to say? I wish it hadn't. Mm -hmm. So, so this is, uh, that was something that I wanted to explore with Oliver Mm -hmm. and to realize that he had invested so much into being an O'Toole and then discover that he wasn't an O'Toole. Or maybe he's more of an O'Toole than ever because he has to work for it and think about what that means. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so there's your scoop. (laughs) That's an incredible scoop. (laughs) And I love that verse, especially um, to them who are called according to his purpose. So that purpose part is so important because, you know, a lot of times we are kind of like in the state of like, oh, but you know all things work together for good to them who love God according to his purpose so it's not necessarily all the things that are everything's going to be great because we love Jesus it's just that things are going to be woven in such a way that even if we go through these hard times and these hard difficulties in the end it's all going to work out according to God's plan for us and you know with your story I mean had that not happened we wouldn't have had the storyline that was so impactful for so many people um so that just means it just means so much you know thank you thank you well it means a lot to me <laughs> <laughs> well and how funny that you would say woven Casey because I don't know uh, if you know this or not Martha but on our podcast you have been affectionately and honorably dubbed the master weaver <laughs> So sweet. Because everything is just woven together so beautifully. And the coincidences aren't coincidences. And but everything still makes sense in a realistic manner, but they're profound. And yeah, we we just we we constantly say, here's Martha's writing again, (laughs) Master Weaver. (laughs) We say it all the time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That that's that's what so makes it so fun to write these shows. You know, really, really fun. And I have a great big uh, dining room table, and I have little three by five cards. You know, I talk about technophobe. <laughs> I cannot move things around on a on a on a screen, and I need to put it on the table. And nobody eats. Everybody eats in the kitchen while I'm writing a script. <laughs> all, the, all the cards are out on the table and I move them around and it's so satisfying particularly when I finished an act to mm-hmm. just scoop all those cards and put them down and see and I keep scooping after act after act but you you can really see it and you can mm-hmm. see uh, the, all these little moments that can come back and, and be played again or you know, there's a lot of little um and a lot of little easter eggs I have um, it'll be interesting. I'd love to talk to you after you see the show um, because I made an extra special effort this time to put a lot of Easter eggs in the show. And by Ooh. my count, there are either callbacks or Easter eggs, uh, uh, at least 20. So it'll be interesting oh. to find them. Okay. Uh, and postal detectives. <laughs> we got to keep a tally. Yes. Right. That's right. I call 20 and you get a pair. <laughs> The honor of catching them all. (laughs) (laughs) So Martha, what would you say has been the most challenging part? You've kind of talked about how it has been challenging. What would be the most challenging aspect of writing and producing Sign Sealed Delivered for you? Um, I think, I think the most challenging was that we never knew if we were coming back. Mm. so every show I mean we knew we had an order for 10 episodes so Mm -hmm. there was an arc there that we were able to create before we aired the first one and take it to Hallmark and we said the first two will be this the second two will be this the third and we real really had it all pretty much planned out where we would land Mm -hmm. by um by episode 10 Mm -hmm. after the pilot so that would be the 11th show basically Mm -hmm. um and then we didn't know if we were coming back and at that point i actually had said to hallmark it was a real pleasure thank you very much you know we we really didn't know Mm -hmm. um we did the the i think the christmas episode was so beautifully and well received but i i actually put in that angel 
in the Christmas episode, just as sort of a wink to everybody, because I thought that would be the last one. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to get a little supernatural here because we'll probably won't be coming back. <laughs> then you do another one. And so it, it, every time it was trying to, how can I, how can I um, push the, the emotional football down the field with our characters mm. um, and yet give us some sort of satisfaction if we don't come back? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's always been that way. And that's been hard. I mean, if you look at um, uh, uh, To the Altar, mm-hmm. the perfect example. Yeah. Perfect yeah. example. Um, you, we just didn't know if we, were, if we were coming back. Now, knowing that you were coming back, for example, like the treasure box. Yeah. We, knew, we knew we were coming back for another episode. So I could go a little off book there and try something really interesting, which mm-hmm. I thought, by the way, if I, if I had a favorite show that I actually sitting there writing, it was the treasure box. And, oh, I wish I had two hours to do that show because all the things we had to cut from, from oh, home I letters bet. are yeah. heartbreaking. I mean, someday maybe I'll just, you know, when it's all over, We'll we'll do a reading of the whole thing because I did I brought um, sh- I brought Eric and Kristen into my um, hotel room when I finished it and just the two of them and I sat in the hotel room and they read it for the first time aloud so I could hear it and they didn't know what they were about to read because um, I wanted <laughs> if it was working I wanted to see mm-hmm. I wanted them to understand how it felt to read these letters, not knowing when those letters had been written. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so there was so much more to that, but that's, you know, that's the, if you want to know what's challenging, it's <laughs> it, killing all off those babies, you know, mm. really, it's, it's yeah. never all going to make it onto the screen. Oh, I wanted to see a full movie of To Whom It May Concern. That that was the one I was like. I want a full movie on this one. <laughs> well, I think you know, two hallmarks, great credit. Um, they recognized that we had so much more to say in an episode. You know, mm-hmm. so um, that was that was really when we realized what what we could do with more time. Mm-hmm. And that really made a huge difference in the storytelling. Good. So it became something you know, it became something different in a way. We grew. Um, we may not have known if we were ever coming back, but man, did we take advantage as a result of that you know, <laughs> next hour. We got the audience. Let's we do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think one burning question that we all have, oh what <laughs> would you say? Um, with what five words would you describe the vows we have made? Without any spoilers, obviously. Made. Martha wins the game. <laughs> there you go. Um, it can be a phrase. It can be just five adjectives or five separate words. You know, on I would say the vows I have made. Um, mm-hmm. That <laughs> this is um, I don't know if you know that my husband had a stroke in the middle of the of the pilot. Oh no! So um, when we were shooting the pilot. The last few days of the pilot, um, I got a call that um, on the phone from my husband, and he said, "I." Um, and again, it's one of those moments. I, I, I had, <laughs> I was getting a massage, a desperately needed massage after five or six weeks of every single day working, yeah. and I went into the massage room and put my robe on the thing and forgot for the first time in my life to take out to turn the phone off Um. and it rang in the middle of the massage and something told me to answer it and that was Mm -hmm. my darling husband John and he said 
I said, I, I think I have to take this. You know, I could have ignored it, but I, and then he said, hi. And I said, Are you, what's up? And he said, um, I think I'm having one of those things. And I said, what? He said, you know, when you can't move your arm or your leg. And I said, I think you're having, I think you're having a stroke. And he, um, he said, yeah, I want that. And I said, John, and he was uh, on a mountain in Colorado. Mm. Uh, in a, he was in a, a, a house, but nevertheless, I said, is the door unlocked? And he said, I think so. And I said, you need to go to the bath bathroom and take an aspirin. I don't know if that's good medical advice or not, but that's, I had read that somewhere. And I said, go. And he said, well, where's, where is the bathroom? And I went, oh, oh no. trouble. So the short version is that um, that uh, Brandy, Brandy Harkonnen, my dear colleague, um, was upstairs in that hotel. And I called her and I said, you got to take over and I'm, I'm getting on a plane. Mm. And so we, um, I uh, ran, ran to a plane and got, made it to Colorado. And he had had a massive stroke. Wow. And by the grace of God, again, somebody was driving down the hill, the, the ambulance was lost and they took him up, but you know, all those little moments. But um, he was, um, he, he was si significantly uh, affected by it and continues to be to this day. Um, and yet he, he and I had worked on Touched by an Angel. That's how we met. That's, you know, that's, we got married, you know, during Touched by an Angel. Mm -hmm. And he had been my best friend before we got married. He was my best supporter and protector. And so here I was feeling totally out, you know, doing a show without him in the background, at least, you know, being able mm -hmm. to, you know, to read a script or give me notes or support me or give me advice. And, um, and yet the best of him was always there with me, which was his wisdom and his absolute love. I mean, for the, for the first few weeks, he called me Julie, which was the, <laughs> the name of his, 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 his prior wife, previous wife. <laughs> A perfectly lovely lady, <laughs> um, but nevertheless, you know, so we knew we were, you know, he had a long, long journey to make. And um, I could have quit Science Hill Delivered right then. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yet he was, he, he said, you know, the show must go on. This will be, he said, you, I need, to, he had to learn to walk again and he had to learn to, you know, read again. And he had to learn to do all, all sorts of things again. And he said, but I, I have to make those moves. I have to lift those weights. I have to take those steps. You can't do those for me. But what you can do is carry on with the things that we love to do. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so when I think about the, the, <laughs> the vows we have made, the vow that he made to me to support me and the vow that I made to him to keep going and honor our our marriage and our relationship and our family, my darling girls who were, you know, essentially lost a lot, you know, you know, our whole life changed in, you know, in, in a minute, mm. but that, that there was still work to do. And he said, the best way I can support that is to, for me to get as, as good as I can be, and you to continue to be as good as you can be to show our children that mm. this is how you carry on in adversity. And so those were those that that was that has been over the course of Sign Seal Delivered, a message that I continue to to try to to share that the, there was the adversity. You do walk through the desert. You do look for the impossible dream. You do try to find what it is that makes you an O'Toole. You know, you do force yourself to open that letter and find the $20 bill from your dad, even if you're angry with him. You do find a way to tell um, Norman that you're in love with him. Um, you know, you do, uh, you, you do carry on, you don't give up. Um, as painful and as hard, you you know, Oliver was ready to give up because he thought that Shane had given up on him. And yet he still carried that little napkin in his breast pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, 
um, the things that I carried of my husband, knowing that I thought I'd lost him, <laughs> but I haven't, you know, <laughs> it's different, but I haven't lost him. And, and that, those are the things that you try to translate and find ways to share with the audience that's counting on you to be honest and true about life. Um, that's why things don't always wrap up in, a, in the happiest of bows. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why um, I think when we talk to the vows we have made, it, there is something we, I mean, obviously you've seen Shane, at least from the back in a wedding veil, you know, you've seen, um, you know, you know that, that I think that if we didn't know what was coming with Hallmark, um, we might have, have attenuated that. We may not have, you know, we may have waited a bit longer to get them married, but we all have waited so long. We waited so long just to see them kiss. <laughs> so why, you know, there are plenty of stories to tell with two married couples in the DLO. Yes, and, absolutely. Um, there's even so, more to tell. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. So there was something truly about saying the vows that uh, Norman and Rita made um, reflect the values uh, that of this show. The vows that um, Oliver and Shane will make will mm -hmm. um, reflect something so unique and special about about them and about um, this little family that was created. Um, and that family carries on, uh, family presses on, family finds new ways, um, and it may not always be the dream that you started with, but mm -hmm. it is the uh, it is all things work together for good um, to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, we are all living, you know, in God's purpose right now. The, very best we can and I hope that's reflected in the show so yes I don't think there's a better way to end <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing wow I oh. <laughs> I am so completely touched if you'll pardon the pun <laughs> yeah, you guys are you guys are great and I it has meant the world um to me to to hear so much about um how much you have taken from the show, how much you've given to us by just supporting us in so many ways and to support the actors on the show. Um, I could not have been blessed with four better, more professional, more accomplished, more loving actors and, and friends. You know, everybody says, oh, we're all just a family. You always hear that on shows, but yeah. just really... <laughs> is you know it's really an amazing family and we get together off screen and do stuff you know and that that's mm -hmm. really important that we've you know so I have these two wonderful families I have my my little nuclear family with my husband and my dear children and I have this wonderful family with signed seal delivered and um and and then the broader family of all those postables and uh, they're not going away <laughs> no they're not <laughs> Yes. Trust the timing. <laughs> I mean, exactly. The timing. Yes. You're told I, the cows come home. <laughs> oh, I'm, I, I, golly, I don't think I have a cow in this next one. I should have put a cow. <laughs> all right. Well, all the more reason to push for, for the next one. So. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for this chance to be with you. It's just been a real blessing. It's a great way to kind of finish up, you know, the long weeks of, of preparation. And I can't mm -hmm. wait to hear what you have to say. All right. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Martha. This has been wonderful. Your joy. Hi. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm, that was profound. That was <laughs> Wow. No words. We're just speechless. <laughs> we, we are. We're, we're, we are. It just proves that she earned that title. She's the master weaver. Master weaver. Wow. I, I, I am, I'm, a, I am at a loss for words. I might start crying here. <laughs> to like cry. start crying. <laughs> but just Martha's wisdom 
in her sharing her stories about how she got into the film industry and the stories about, um, you know, how each of the characters are parts of her and um, even the story about um, her sharing about her husband and that that um, circumstance there, like, wow, wow. And about her dad's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, that's one thing that I took from her is her fearlessness mm-hmm. to put herself out there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they always say, write what you know. Well, oh my word, she yeah. wrote what she knew. Mm-hmm. And she put such a depth and a sincerity and a value on those lessons that she mm-hmm. has learned and she's not afraid to put them out there and let us learn from them. Mm-hmm. It, it's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. I think that's why our stories work so well is because they are personal and they are meaningful, not only to the audience, but to her too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we hope you enjoyed our interview with Martha Williamson, a creator of Signs Still Delivered, executive producer of Touched by an Angel. And we sure did. <laughs> yes, we did. And where can we watch the next installment? Who wants to give a shout out to next week's episode? Movie. Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. On your favorite streaming service, Philo Friendly. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Philo Friendly, 8 Central, 9 Eastern, I believe is the time. Don't forget, in January of 2022, there is going to be the place where you can meet so many of these lovely people at the Rama Drama Convention in West Palm Beach, Florida. Woo! The plan is that the three of us will be there. Yes. We hopefully you can come and join us. So fingers crossed. Drama drama official and get that and get that info. But Crystal, Jeff, Kristen, Eric, (laughs) Eric, Zach, Zach, and Gregory. They're all gonna be there. So what a treat that will be for the postables. Gonna be a fun time, (laughs) y'all. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.